These are the Jupiter Files for the week of Monday, August 22nd, 2011. Now, we've got a little follow-up from last week. You'll remember that there was a glorious little town in Alaska, all covered with orange goo. And it seemed as though that orange goo was tiny eggs. Tiny, little, unidentified crustacean eggs that had seemingly washed up from the ocean and rained from the sky. This was creepy. However, more analysis has led to a different conclusion. In fact, it looks as though it wasn't eggs at all, but fungus that is really a disease, a, a plant disease, a, a, let me start over with that. It is fungus, it is fungal spores that has a particular plant disease that is basically a rust disease that causes particular plants to turn orange, which caused the, the awesome orange look of it all. Now, there's still a little bit of mystery around this. Namely, what the heck kind of fungus is it? In fact, they have yet to identify what kind of fungus it is. Now, the researchers in question are quick to point out that there are a lot of different types of fungus uh, up near the North Pole area that have yet to be identified. So this is not crazily out of the ordinary. However, it is not known if it is poisonous or toxic in any way or what effect it'll have on the local water supply, uh, human respiratory systems, uh, you know, what sort of allergic issues might be, be caused by this. And they still don't know where it came from. They don't know the, the, the plant that released these spores. So there's a plant somewhere that released these spores, a lot of these spores, and then a disease that went along with it that cause them to become orange and become an orange goo. So it's not quite as freaky as a bunch of crustacean eggs raining down from the sky. And our imagination immediately goes to raining down from space because that's incredibly cool to think of crustacean eggs raining down from space. But still kind of interesting. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that one just because I don't like things that unknown raining down on anybody it kind of freaks me out a little bit and just the same it still looks very egg like i know they're spores but they look like these little tiny fish eggs anyway that's what they are they're little tiny spores they've got a rust disease that causes them to become orange not quite as freaky at first sight but still very very interesting now on to this week's rather odd set of events it's been an interesting week to say the least in fact there was a chupacabra sighting, but not quite a chupacabra. This, what you're seeing in front of you, was sighted here in the States. In fact, in, in Maryland. It, outside of a hospital, this particular animal was described as being a little bit like a kangaroo, a little bit like a deer, and a little bit like a dog. A lot of people saw it. A lot of people had the opportunity to take pictures of it and video of it. And MSNBC got the report. Now, they even went so far as to capture this little creature, which does look an awful lot like kind of a funky deer, but not quite. They captured it in a cage, took a lot of up-close shots, and then released it. And they're generally calling it a chupacabra-ish creature. Almost like chupacabra light. The chupa. The difference between this and a standard chupacabra, of course, is it did not look like this particular creature was going around and draining the blood out of goats and sheep. And then flying off into the Mexican desert. Which is more along the lines of what a chupacabra does. Now, if you don't know what a chupacabra is. Here's, here's the basic essence. In the mid-90s, there were a series of sheep killings and goat killings where there were sets of puncture wounds on the animal and the animal was just drained, just drained of blood, just basically sucked dry, very vampire-esque. 
along with a number of sightings. And this, et cetera, et cetera, led Rays to the, the myth of the chupacabra. Now, near as I can tell, no one's ever captured a chupacabra. I've never seen a real good picture of a chupacabra. Chupacabra seems to me like one of those catch-alls that is often used to explain unexplained phenomenon in livestock. So I'm not really the biggest chupacabra believer. I've, I've listened to a number of, of things uh, such as on Coast to Coast AM, and I've read a number of articles online where people have conspiracy theories where the chupacabra is uh, perhaps an alien. Perhaps the chupacabra is an experimental animal that was let loose. Perhaps something from Plum Island or, or similar facilities. Which, that'd be a fun topic. We should talk about that someday. However, I've seen no real evidence of it, but there have been a lot of crazy animal things that have happened over the years, so I'm not writing anything off completely. But this particular animal, let's take another quick look at it. It looks a lot like a deer. It looks a lot like a deer. Let's see if we can get a, a better shot of it here. But it isn't quite a deer. In fact, they have been trying to identify exactly what this animal is, and no one's had a lot of success yet. Where this is strange is that it is in a highly populated portion of northeastern United States. It's strange when you see animals that you've never seen before in that sort of area. It's like walking downtown San Francisco and seeing a kangaroo jump out of nowhere, except instead of a kangaroo head, it's got a lion head, and no one's ever seen anything like that. While that's entirely possible, there, there, there could be an animal that looks like a kangaroo with a lion head hopping around somewhere, you don't necessarily expect to see it next door to a hospital where there's lots of people, lots of development already happening. So what exactly this is, I'm not sure. Is it just kind of a particular mutation? Did two types of animals mate that don't normally mate? Uh, it's kind of a very Liger-esque scenario, perhaps. Perhaps it's, it escaped from an animal testing facility. Perhaps it's a deer that is very, very sick. Just the same, no one's been yet able to identify what this is at all. I'm going to keep an eye on that just because I don't like not knowing what animals are hopping around in my backyard. I don't think it's a chupacabra, despite what people want to put uh, label-wise onto it. Now let's move on to something a little more interesting. Now this is just news, what we're going to talk about here. No conjecture, straight up news. There are plans in place to take man to Mars. Now what's happening here is there is currently a project going on called the Mars 500, which is a 520 day simulation. What they've done is they took a set of cosmonauts basically a set of, of astronauts put them into a small simulation of a spaceship and kept them trapped in there for 520 days to simulate what it would be like to live together in that closer proximity with that sort of equipment with that sort of contact with the outside world on a trip to Mars and that'll kind of tell us the viability of it. How will people be able to function both physically and mentally when they arrive at Mars? Will they be able to get back in time? What, how will they be working? Will they be able to continue to work together and make logical decisions? There's a lot of questions that need to be answered there. Well, the Mars 500 project is set to end, I believe it is, I'm not sure this article here says, but I believe it's this coming October. I think it's, it's this fall. Now, based on the outcome of that, the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency, which has an awesome name that I always forget, it is, I gotta read this off to you guys, it's a fantastic name for an agency. Oh, where are you? Where are you, Russian Space Agency? Well, I'll find it and read it off to you guys here shortly. Let's just call it, uh, oh yeah, Roscosmos, Roscosmos, R-O-S-K-O-S-M-O-S, -O -S -O -S. great name. Great name, the Russian space agency there, Roscosmos. Anyway, far cooler than NASA. NASA's a great name. NASA's iconic, but Roscosmos sounds awesome. Now, this is exciting. Now, this is a joint venture between both the European Union and Russia. 
And this would be a very exciting thing to have happen. I would love to see mankind set foot on Mars. I know there's a lot of a lot of great science we can do by putting probes up there, by sending robots and, and unmanned vehicles to Mars. And I want to see more of that happen. And I want to see more exploration happen of deep space as well as other planetary bodies within our solar system. But Mars is very iconic. Mars sits out there and calls to us and has done so since the dawn of time, since the dawn of man, since we've been looking up at the sky, we've seen Mars, and it's very far away, and it's very, very tiny, but it's been there, and it's always been there, and it's tantalizingly close. Not close like the moon, but we already went to the moon. Granted, we should go back and see what's happening up there, but it's not Mars. We haven't been there yet. We gotta, we gotta get up to Mars. What bothers me about this and I know we have a lot of international viewers and listeners. I don't mean this in a negative way at all. But it bothers me that NASA, that America, is not doing this. Not that I think that the European Union and the Russian uh, agency, space agencies should not do it. I think they should do it as well. It bothers me that we're not all doing it. Because two reasons. One is that I feel that NASA is NASA is an icon. NASA put men on the moon. We walked around up there because of NASA. I would like to see NASA continue in that awesomeness, to continue in that level of inspiration, to get us up there, to get us up to Mars, to let us walk around and really enjoy it. I would like to see that. To me, it feels like a letdown that we're not doing it, that NASA isn't doing it, that America's not doing it. I could go off on a huge political speech about how we're spending money in the wrong ways here in America and not sending men to, to Mars, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say it's disappointing. However, thank you to the European U Union and the Russian Space Agency for picking up the slack there and... and uh, at least working to get men to Mars. It's a it's a very exciting possibility, and I have really high hopes that this this really does come to fruition. There have been rumors and inklings and plans to get man to Mar men to Mars in the past that haven't come through, that we know of. No, I don't don't think we have. But man, it would be great to see this happen. The other the other reason this bothers me is not just that it's a it's a it's a bummer that NASA isn't doing it, but I would like to see mul multiple agencies not just necessarily work together, but have simultaneously in tandem projects to accomplish the same goal. It increases the likelihood that that the individual projects succeed. If we have one mission to Mars, if the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency get together, they create a big old rocket, strap some guys to the outside of that rocket and launch it at Mars. Hopefully they do a little better than that. But if they just do one thing, they send one ship and it fails, that's going to be it. I don't, I don't foresee other governments going, hey, the Europeans and uh, Russians coming together couldn't uh, accomplish it, but hey, we here in whatever country we're in, we here in Canada or we here in America, we can definitely pull it off and it's obviously worthwhile. And there'll be huge public support for something that has failed 100% of the time so far. See, that's the problem. We, we send one ship and it fails, it dooms the idea for a decade or more before you can get people back on the side of trying the project again. So I'd love to see, I'd love to see like America and Canada and the UK and maybe Australia all come together and make one project and, and the European Union and Russia come together and make one project and Japan can send their own up and you know, whatever they want to, China can send one up. I would love to see competing projects. We'd get it done faster, we'd probably get it done better and then maybe at the end we could all come together and share tips and tricks of how to get to Mars the most awesome way. Would love to see that. So this is both awesome news and kind of a bummer news from the side of NASA, but awesome news just the same because going to Mars would be so sweet. Now, I want to talk a little bit about things that are not crop circles. And by that, I mean things that are sand circles. In China, outside of, oh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, uh, Xining or Xining, on the Chinese-Tibetan border, basically on the border um, between China and Tibet, 
uh, along what is called the Qing, Qinghai Highway, there is a sand circle. It's basically a crop circle, except in the sand. And it is huge. It is a, has a diameter, a rough estimate, of between one and two kilometers. Basically between half a mile and a mile and a quarter. Huge. Mile and a quarter, you guys. Huge. Huge with fairly straight lines. And I want to show you guys this. This is fantastic. Picture's a little grainy because it's a little zoomed in there. Look at that thing. Crazy looking. Just crazy looking. Here's a little more up close shot. So you can see what it looks like from more of a inside of it point of view. Look at this thing. Phenomenal lines. Straight. Well laid out. Serious time went into this. Now here's the thing. Crop circles are very interesting. Are, are very, very interesting to me. But, but look at this picture here. If you are making a crop circle, there are very easy ways to hide your footprints walking around. This is in sand. It is on sand. Hiding your footprints on sand, much more difficult. And yet look at these pictures. There are no footprints. They did a phenomenal job. I mean, if obviously the likelihood is here that someone made these. Uh, obviously. I mean, someone made these. These aren't just like a naturally occurring phenomenon. I, I, I wouldn't suppose that, that uh, you know, the wind normally kicks up and, and makes something looks like that. At least it doesn't in my backyard. At best, it gets really windy and, and some bushes get blown around and I get some leaves in my gutter. Unless in China, the wind is way, way cooler and creates this sort, these sorts of patterns. So someone made these. Now you could go out on a limb and say, oh, it's extraterrestrials. Well, it's freaky looking. It's freaky looking. It's not, it's definitely, you know, otherworldly in style. Or at least we want to believe it's otherworldly in style. But the real, the real cool thing here is no footprints that anyone can see. Now I was looking around for some more information, more detailed information about what this is, trying to see what the history of sand circles are in that area of, of China. And I wasn't able to come up with anything. I got, I got a few tidbits here and there, certainly no great pictures, a few mentions in some news articles about uh, smaller sand circles, but nothing a mile plus in diameter, a mile plus. How many crop circles you know of that are a mile in diameter? It's huge, huge, it's ginormous. Then again, there's a lot of people in China. Maybe they could get a lot of people together, like a flash mob. But how, how, how would you control a flash mob to make something that accurate? I just don't see flash mobs being that great. Then again, there have been flash mobs where they've done the Michael Jackson thriller dance, and there have been hundreds of people doing the thriller dance, and they've done quite well. You can look that up online and see what I'm talking about. And the thriller dance is not the easiest dance to do, at least for me, but I'm a very bad dancer. So, you know, that's my whole analysis based on that, is this is hard to do like the thriller dance, yet more awesome and wider and in China.